Okay. All right. All right. Welcome everyone to the Cleveland R user group. We're very honored today to have uh, Dirk Edelbutel uh, tell us about his uh, latest R project, R2U. Um, but uh, Dirk's really well known in the R community. It's a real honor to have him here. You've probably heard of one of his uh, projects. Just a short list would be uh, if you've ever installed R on uh, Debian or Ubuntu, if you use the Rock or Docker containers, if you use anything with RCPP, uh, that is Dirk is a driving force. Uh, so he's a real value to the R community. And today he's going to tell us about this new project, R2U, for installing all of CRAN as binaries on Ubuntu. It's amazing. I had high expectations since it was coming from Dirk, and I was still impressed. I've used it in multiple CI pipelines. It's um, unbelievably fast. So uh, if you're doing any sort of local or remote uh, cloud development using Ubuntu, this is a this will be a great talk, and, and you really want to uh, follow along. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it off to Dirk. Thanks for being here, Dirk. Thanks for having me. Um, screen share should be on. So you've seen the slides now. Yes. So um, good afternoon or good evening. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here. And I'll talk about uh, what I first called Cranapt. And then I got a little narrower R to you because it just deals with Ubuntu. Um, this uh, has been in the works for a couple of months now and is doing really well. Uh, it makes me really, really happy. I, like John, get a lot of use out of it in different pipelines. And I'm trying to show you sort of how it works, what's behind it and all the rest of it, and maybe get one or two of you excited as well. Because when I was about to talk about this for the first time a couple of months ago at the Chicago Art User Group, I kind of thought, gee, you know, over the years, I had a couple of esoteric talks and uh, random topics that would maybe interest two or three people. And this one's squarely in that bracket. But then again, maybe also it isn't because I'll talk about deployment for Linux, Ubuntu specifically, and that may actually affect uh, many more of us than initially think about this. Because even if you're a happy R user on the Mac or some other platform, you may be using Ubuntu unbeknownst or in an, not that intentionally when you're using CI or cloud use or other uh, use cases. So it's somewhere on the edge between extremely esoteric and not quite so esoteric. A uh, brief word then about who I am. These days I work as a software engineer in a uh, company building a new data representation system that's uh, large scale, cloud ready and all the rest of it. And we're hiring. So come and talk to us. We're doing really well with bioinformatics, geospatial and a couple of other things. Um, I also have the good uh, fortune to have the opportunity to teach a course once a year, virtually down in Urbana. I still do that remotely here from Chicago. So that has to do with plumbing. I talk about programming and data science and basically programming backings for statistical and data science work. And I have been doing open source work basically since forever because I seemingly cannot stop. Um, that, uh, that bug bit me while I was a grad student and I'm still at it. And a lot of that has to do with Debian work. I first did that because I'm a heavy and happy Unix user and was then glad to um, contribute something back. And highlighting now really a lot of this experience is Debian. And from Debian, it slowly moved to um, uh, being less shy and then daring enough to maybe upload a package to CRAN and then two, and that was early on. So by now it's a few. And some of those are super fringe. Uh, some of those, some others had uh, a, a reasonable amount of pickup. So digest is just about everywhere where people uh, need a hash sum um, of an R object. So it's, for example, in every NITA run and uh, what have you. And then, of course, the whole RCBP stack uh, got really successful. And with that, I made some contacts and I got asked to um, help with the R Foundation board. And yeah, um, Rocker is also there, and that should also be highlighted because it gets again to this aspect that we're talking about today, which is bundling, providing as binaries packages from CRAN because we're our users and we're all happy as kids in a toy store or kids in a candy store because CRAN's fantastic. Um, some online rumbles notwithstanding, they're doing unbelievably good work in terms of quality insurance and by providing. Uh, an always accessible, always working um, archive repository of statistical methods and packages that's more or less guaranteed to work with itself because of the quality control that they're providing. Now, how does one get um, content from CRAN on one's machine? 
the world's most popular operating system, of course, is still Windows. And when I thought about how I would visualize that with just one punchy picture, this one was a good fit because it's really like a trampoline. Windows is easy. You can bounce around. You can do your thing. You're also in a small little cage. As soon as you leave it, you may hurt yourself and start bleeding. So um, it has its downsides. It's maybe not the greatest um, environment for developing. And over the years, I think, informally speaking, uh, no actual measurements. I've seen more other developers moving away from Windows to other possibly more developer-friendly operating systems. But Windows is clearly there, and it's bouncy, and it's fun. It's not the only operating system. These days, many R users are on another one, which uses truly beautiful um, hardware, is well laid out. And a lot of people are also very happy on uh, these Apple machines and under Mac OS. Some of us think it's still a little too constraining that you can do things and they work very well if you do exactly as you're told. I'm sometimes at the receiving end of bug reports or people being frustrated when they're trying to develop on that with some packages. So for example, why the RCVP stack, sometimes Fortran comes in, Apple doesn't give that, you know, Apple doesn't quite work so well with uh, the full development stack. So you have to do things there. Open MPI isn't there. So it's, it's, it's very elegant, very pretty, and moves very gracefully and, and, and well. But so you have to do what you're told. Which then, of course, brings us to the elephant in the room, the third operating system. And what I really wanted to show here <clears throat> was this very meme picture from the Narco series where the guy just sits uh, either on his bench or on the swing and just uh, gazes in the sky. Because on Linux, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we even had packages as the other two do? Because that's a little bit of the cost, <laughs> excuse me, of the Tower of Babel. There are too many dialects, um, too many distributions. So it makes it difficult to provide binaries comprehensively. So generally, we don't, we don't have them. So to sum up, Windows is sort of just works really well for pre-made binaries. And getting those is sort of a bit of a, um, of, of a good benchmark to compare against, even if Development can be trickier. Same holds for macOS. You get binaries from CRAN and they just work great. Um, you know, small exceptions on occasion not, notwithstanding. Um, both operating systems also have alternate um, providers of binaries via, for example, Contaforge, um, which also works, but not completely for Linux. And Linux is just generally complicated. Some distros have binaries within them. Um, people can install from source. Um, sometimes people flail um, in magnificent ways. Uh, I've seen really long Twitter threads or Stack Overflow questions where people just pull their hair out because they can't make something work from source for CI or other places. So it's 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 tricky. We can all make it work. Um, uh, many of us working on Linux are quite comfortable doing so, and over the years we've have come to accept that there may be a certain tax in terms of developer time because you always have to wait a little bit for the compilation time. So then there's tricks for that. Ccache is one that I use. We had C to D for you. I get to that in a second too. So basically, what this talk about is to make that third case of Linux as easy and compelling as the Windows and the MacOS case. And we can do this at least for Ubuntu. Doing it for all Linux distributions is a little trickier because there's just too many of them. So enter R to you, and um, uh, it actually continues a longer line of uh, previous work. And oddly enough, I seemingly can't let go of this very question. So I have been involved in quite a few of these uh, fewer endeavors. The very first one was by Albrecht Gebhardt, who was basically on CRAN before um, many of us were there, so in the in the 90s. And around the early 2000s, I forget the exact start date, he wrote a Perl script that takes the content from CRAN. The content on CRAN is actually perfectly normalized and standardized so that building it in automated scripted fashion is a really um, natural target, but you know it's it's involved. But he did that, and then a few of us built on top of this and extended it. Um, I think we also did that in a Google Summer of Code context. I think David was a student or somehow was a volunteer. And then 
Stefan and I um, supervised that a little and helped a little and I let that run. And that was that was that was fine, but it had architectural limits as a Perl script. And then uh, somehow I had the idea to um, get involved with the rewrite and offer to mentor that and uh, had the good fortune of getting Charles as a student. Charles at the time was a grad student at University College London, home of um, uh, the uh, um, um, what do they call them? I mean, they come to behind Google Brain and many of the Google Brain employees, where he ended up then too. He redid this all in R, really clever, really good code. Um, and when he was done with the Group Sum of Code project, I continued to run the system and provide binaries and did that for about a year. Actually, was about to present it to Cran in Vienna, and then it just died. Um, we had the metadata and all the infrastructure backing in a SQLite database, and that wasn't properly backed up, uh, sadly, my fault. And that database just oddly had never seen anything like it, just uh, corrupted itself, and that was that was the end of it. And the main cost for these these things is basically the metadata setup that you have to sort of compile package by package or by complicated package to complicated package, and then we didn't redo this. But someone else jumped into the fray. So I have these, you know, 25 or so years of work with Debian as a relatively marginal contributor at the very edge of the tree. While I look after quite a number of packages, they're all sort of simple packages, grand packages, packages at the leaves, not, not the core. Don is a bit more of a central Debian person and was at one point the head of the technical committee. He's also a bioinformatician. And during his uh, grad school and postdoc days, did a rebuild basically of, of the system that we have. And I can't quite remember whether he actually was based on some of, of where they started with some of Charles's code or did it all anew. But he had a system that had full CRAN and bioconductor. And, you know, being a sophisticated coder and techie, he had done that right and was on a system with full RAID disk mirrors and all the rest of it. But, you know, that too blew up, uh, took the disks down. And while we then would have had funding, say, why some of the resources that Debian had, and we talked about redoing this, we just didn't get to that because it's a, it, it can be a relatively steep hill to climb uh, to build sort of all of CRAN and get the, get the stuff together. Uh, in parallel though, something that we all have uh, used happily for all those years, Michael Rutter of Penn State had done a parallel approach um, also either taking over from CRANDEP v1 or v2, and then wrote a couple of scripts that basically feed it into Launchpad, which is the build system behind Canonical's uh, Ubuntu distribution. And that's still up, and he covers about 5,000 packages. So that's that's still alive. And then at one point, uh, Michael, Don, myself, Gabor, went to the R Consortium and um, uh, ask for Grant to build some infrastructure to do this anew, and uh, we wrote a proper proposal, and it was uh, you know, accepted and, um, and, and, and granted, and we had funds, but that was uh, later uh, taken away from us again because we didn't uh, actually get organized enough and find spare time to to get going, so we uh, we didn't really produce anything, so that uh, that, that counts as a fail. But uh, what you see there basically is 20 years and different attempts of doing this either partially or in full. Some succeeded, uh, went a certain way, and then hit a brick wall. Other smaller approaches are still up and running, but sadly not covering all of France. So we can conclude it's possible to do, but it's hard and a lot of work. It has, however, been done at times also in full. Um, it is still being done by some others. Inyaki, friend of mine and also a CRAN package author, is doing this for Fedora. Uh, Detlef Steuer, very quiet fellow uh, in Hamburg, has been doing that for the uh, German-based OpenSUSE uh, distribution that actually provides a build service anybody can use for any distro and even other OSs called uh, Open Build System or, or, or SUSE Open Build System, OBS. And then, of course, as I mentioned, Michael Rutter. And uh, sort of concluding a little, these things seem to work better if they can rely on systems that help or build parts of it. So the question then was, if Inyaki does this for Fedora and Detlef for, for OpenSUSE, how can we fill the gap and put a complete Ubuntu or Debian solution in? And that's basically what I had been pondering for quite some time and wondered about what we could do there. 
Now, how do some of these things work? And if you're not familiar with Debian or Ubuntu and these packages, I have a few slides here just just show how those packages look and then compare them with how our prime package look. So here I'm invoking the package manager uh, DPKG, Debian package manager, I think it's the acronym is short, and short option S show just gives the content of an uh, installed uh, package. So this is not pointing at a tarball, but a package that's there. And this is one of the existing packages that help with packaging because it takes a, a trivial uh, piece of code, just something that prints Hello World, but goes through the motion of building this. So what you see here is the metadata of a Debian package. And it's no coincidence that this looks very familiar to an R and Prem developer because the um, R package um, description file um, is modeled after this format and uses the same passing infrastructure internally in R's tools that's, that's still called uh, DCF, Debian Control Format. So we basically have E colon and then a set of values for different fields. Some of them include dependencies or build type. This one, for example, tells us that this is a binary that was built by AMD64 and so on. You can also look in what's inside a package list the content of a package, the files in a package. And here again, I'm using the same one. And because hello is just an example for packaging, there isn't much in it. We see that the fourth line is user bin hello. That's a binary. And there's a bit of package metadata always in user share doc name of the package, as well as in this case, GNU style and info file and uh, uh, a main page. How does it look when we um, consider our packages? It's somewhat similar. So um, one thing that's interesting and sometimes overlooked is the hyphen hyphen build option to our command install. So I'm running this here with a particular um, small example helper package I'm involved with because I just wanted something small that fits on the screen. So this is just something that provides an example for the NLOP package when used with RCPP. So people once asked about that. So when we do this, we see here that there's um, two compilation and a linking step, and then a couple of things uh, get done. And at the end, we have a, a, a compressed tar archive that has the name, version number, and then an architecture line in the middle there. Um, what's inside of this uh, file when we produce this this way is just a subtree of the installation. So that's basically the directory that you would find in a directory in R's library path. It would just expand, uh, write the content of this tarball. And those are the files that are in there. Um, it's just the package, but no metadata about dependency relationships and other stuff. It's just what, what made the package work. Um, and it turns out um, that with something that our studio now pose it, the slides are a little behind because I still always refer to our studio here. So mentally, mentally swap in pose it whenever you see our studio. Um, our studio entered the fray about two years ago with a um, fairly impressive and ambitious undertaking of the R Studio package manager, which by now covers R as well as Python and had always covered packages as they're provided by CRAN, but also through time, something that Microsoft had pioneered with the Microsoft uh, R archive network, MRAN. Um, and our studio also provides builds for different operating systems. <clears throat> and when one looks at the files that they provide there, and for example, downloads the file that I had just shown as build two slides ago, the uh, RCBB analog example, we see that that file contains the exact equivalent of the R command um, build, um, R command install hyphen hyphen build step. It's just that file tree of uh, files that are installed as part of the R command install step and no metadata. So this really is the equivalent step of R command install hyphen hyphen build. Um, so again, about RC, RSPM, it's a quite impressive and wide reaching um, undertaking that provides binaries for Windows, Mac, multiple Linux distributions across different R versions and even Python. 
<clears throat> and also across time, something I'm not stressing here that we're not using in RTU, but could be used along with it. It would just complicate things a little further by adding another orthogonal dimension to it all. It could be done. What RSPM provides is really just the binary, just what our command install hyphen hyphen build does. Things that are not perfect with RSPM and that I long for because I'm very used to systems that have this, Gabby and Ubuntu is, there's no real automatic full system dependency resolution because in honesty, of course, they can't because they're covering Windows and Mac OS and different Linux distros. So it's 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 virtually impossible to do this um, coherently and consistently across all the different delivery platforms that we have. There's also no system management integration on OSs that uh, where, where this could be done. Again, it sort of comes with the territory. R itself also doesn't do that because it lives in user space. So it's something that's near, easy to pull off across the whole bent, um, whole, whole gamut of delivery systems. But um, if one can do it, it's 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 nice to have, which is why some distros have injected packages anyway. And then oddly and, and not very well documented, sometimes it actually doesn't give you binaries, it just gives you sources. And to this day, I haven't quite figured out why and when that is. Also, well, they cover a lot of distributions. Oddly, they don't do Debian. And as far as I'm aware, they're still only providing um, Intel AMD x86 uh, architecture, and for example, not ARM um, for um, some other platforms. But you know, overall, pretty nice. Um, so this got used. It's already quite widely used um, for CI and other places with you know some fill-ins that cover most use cases. Um, um, but you know, we, we can do we can do one better and that's what we're doing here. So um, how would does RSPM work and uh, how did this relate to R2U? So the penny that dropped really was that what RSPM provides is something that we could then use as an input in the creation of a Debian package. Something with which I'm quite familiar because of these, you know, two plus decades um, that have built packages. So I can just take the RSPM binaries, unpack them, and then do the final step of wrapping them into a, into a package, which makes it pretty quick and pretty cheap. And because I use the distros tools around it, I can then actually automate uh, getting the system dependencies back in. So, um, and where the packages don't come pre-made, I can just build from source the slightly longer way. And that's what we're doing when we get source packages or when we, for example, fill in the file contactor packages. So basically the, 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 the big idea that I eventually had this spring and then implemented over two or so weekends in April as a, as a proof of concept was really that I can make this fairly large and insurmountable task of building all of them from scratch for Debian or Ubuntu reduce it by taking their packages, their binaries, and essentially just rewrapping them from uh, their tarballs into, into depth files, and then provide a repository and metadata around this. And I had that then up and running in May and uh, pointed a few friends at it and let them test it and uh, got a bit of thumbs up. Then I got lucky too, because with the campus connection that I now have, we uh, put this on a, a virtual machine on the Urbana campus, which of course is the home of um, um, various computing initiatives and home of Mozilla and all the rest of it is, is super well connected to internet too and all the rest of it. So everybody gets uh, pretty decent bandwidth up until then. And as the, as the main site, it also runs off my, you know, standard retail server here at home over, over um, home broadband. Luckily I am on fiber, so that's viable too. And it's been going quite well. We um, average sort of a couple thousand packages a day. The week before Thanksgiving, we had three consecutive days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that were north of 20,000, which was pretty big. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, working, it's working quite well. So with that, I thought I, um, I, might, I might pause now. I forgot to actually make that explicit. If you have any questions, by all means, just unmute and, and ask them. I um, When I'm in screen share mode, I don't see the chat window. So if anything piled up, I wouldn't know right now, but if there's questions, by, uh, by all means, just just ask me. Otherwise, I'll I'll give a quick demo, and for that, 
because it's also easiest to do this on a machine that, that's empty and or well connected. I'm now at US East at um, 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 AWS at EC2. And so what I then sometimes like to uh, show is sort of one of the standards because everybody knows this one, it's dependencies. Um, this is something that I blocked about. If you do this on an empty machine, like an Ubuntu machine, and you have to compile everything down from sources, it may fail because some development packages aren't there and all the rest of it. And now um, this just basically goes off, has the more than better, better than decent uh, connectivity network wise that um, um, EC2 and Amazon provide. So it, and, and also fast disks under it. So this now took 15 seconds and um, everything is there. Um, what I hadn't made explicit on slides, but really should and fill in <laughs> is another key aspect um, of the, um, let me see if it's already there or not. Um, uh, what package am I thinking of? Um, Um, I have one or two packages that build against this one. This is just the wrap of the GSL. And what you see here is um, that as it's currently built, it's built against version 2.7 of the GNU GSL, GNU Scientific Library. This is a pretty mature library, so it doesn't update every couple of months anymore, but whenever it does, the library name, the major name changes, and with that, the library version changes. So the system may behind the scenes under a normal update go from libgsl 2.7 to when it comes out 2.8. If you have this built the normal way, your R package is in user local, then the system package manager doesn't know of the this explicit but not made explicit dependency between your R package having been compiled against the GSL and the particular version. It may uninstall libgsl27, install gsl28, and what happens to your package when you then say library, any package that uses libgsl, I have one, um, uh, few, few that, that use that, it will just go um, and be broken because the underlying library is, is no longer there. If I um, can actually try to show that live, if I now, said um yep so whereas on the other hand um it now knows app now knows that this package is used by this grand package so it at least warns uh you know um do you really want to do that and prevent the breakage so this is a bit uh, of a convoluted way of saying that if you tie your R installation closer to the system and make the system aware of those dependencies, you actually may end up with uh, with less uh, breakage. So um, that was a quick little demo. I keep this here. So in case we um, have a question later, I want to go over a particular example. It really works for other packages too. I used to record a couple of these uh, uh, screenshots from the terminal into a GIF doing that with Arsten or BRMS or Silva or other packages. So it's quite, it's quite nice. Um, so to sum up, what we have here now with RTU is binaries really rock because as I showed in the demo, wherever you run Ubuntu, you just say install our packages. Um, it goes off and 15 seconds later, you have something as complicated as Tidyverse, which um, you know pulls in a total of, I think it was 90 or so um, grant packages and, and other dependencies you may use. And you may be running Ubuntu explicitly on a server as I do or on your desktop laptop, or you may just use it in the cloud because someone else you know has set it up that way. Or you may use it at GitHub Actions or another system where the CI runners are based on Ubuntu. So because this combination is fairly universal, the appeal is quite um, is quite strong. 
And via R2U, you get now everything that's on CRAN, with the exception of, I think, a handful of packages. I don't build our Oracle because that requires an Oracle installation. Similarly, I think there yeah, one that the Mosaic and another optimization package because you um, you need um, a commercial library there, same as uh, the, the, the Bloomberg Epic. Now, no, that we can even do because they give us a library. So. Um, and another thing that makes uh, this really sing and swing, you saw that I typed install.packages tidyverse and it knew to get Akron tidyverse. That relies on an integration package um, called BSPM, Bridge to the System Package Manager, that Inyaki had first written for his work with the Fedora packages. And it was then easy enough to install over to, um, to Debian and Ubuntu, so he did that. It wraps a trace around installed or packages and basically redirects it. This means that it will need um, super user powers or, or at that point escalate to super user powers to interface with apps but then it can, and that's really what provides the link um, between the R package layer and the system package layer. So install our package ggplot2 would become sudo apt install rcron ggplot2, and BSPM basically fires those um, requests off for us with the build of behind the scenes Python infrastructure. That's really convenient because as users, you don't have to learn another language system vocabulary, um, users of these R systems on Ubuntu don't need to know that it's R hyphen cran hyphen ggplot2. They just concern themselves with I need ggplot2 and then we can go off. This, for example, allows us to use the remotes package in repositories and just say, you know, remotes colon colon install underscore depends. It passes the description files and then installs all packages, including some from source if they are missing. But R2U really is a repository. So if you just want to use it directly with the more Linux, the dpkg and apt command, and not from R, then you can also do it without BSPM. But the two of them really um, are a bit like peanut butter and jelly. They're, they're better together than separate. Um, I updated this chart yesterday for a tweet that you may have seen, and then again earlier today, because it so happens that um, seemingly whenever I gave one of these talks about R2U, this is now the fourth, we had a nice little milestone at the one in September, I was able to announce the um, the mirror. And I think then we were just cracking 400,000 or so. So it so happens that today was the day that, or yesterday was the day that we cracked a million packages delivered. Um, that's a little bit of a white lie in the sense that when I have to build from source, it also goes to R2U and brings its own packages in. So it eats its own dog food, but you can see that it accelerated nicely a little while ago. Uh, Bit of that driver was um, me, myself, and I, because we rebuilt Bioconductor from 315 to 316, and that then for the 230 or so packages all built from source over the two flavors, uh, Ubuntu 2004 and 2204, that, that was probably good for a few thousand um, in that million, million spike, but then it was again real uh, active usage uh, afterwards. How do you get to use this and take advantage of it? It's relatively straightforward, especially if you know a little bit of Ubuntu. So what's on the right is the content of the script that runs this. So essentially, you just have to point to um, the repository that has it, um, have one contact uh, setting to make sure the package sorting works. That's in, in Debian and Ubuntu lingo is called pinning, and that's the instructions in the middle of the screen. You have to also give... Um, uh, some security certificate downloads in so that the handshakes are proper because these remote repositories tend to be signed and then you need the other part of that public key to invalidate the, um, the signing key and all that. And uh, then at the bottom, it's turning on RSPM. So it's it's really not very much. I provide two scripts for both Focal and Jemmy um, um, that you can run or you can run these uh, steps sort of by hand. Um, there was a small change in best practices in, in Ubuntu and Debian land. So I think the way one of these um, repository keys get downloaded changed between Focal and, and, and Jemmy. So the instructions are slightly different between the two of them, but just see how it, how it goes. And you can execute the scripts by hand and validate line by line that it does the right thing and doesn't do anything gnarly to your machine. Not, not that we would, but it's always good to both check and verify. So you can run the scripts or the commands they're in. 
and or you can just use the Docker containers. Um, I use these all the time. The one that we just used in the demo was one of them on the um, AWS uh, instance. I will probably fold this into Rocker at some point. I just haven't gotten around to it and have to sort of sort out how the layering goes because we already had a BSPM container that this sits on top. And um, there is also, and that's a link at the readme of, of the GitHub repo for that, an ability to use that with Gitpod IO. That's a pretty nifty service that is um, essentially the same as what GitHub now calls code spaces. So you just need to register and then um, have the ability to run that. They do all of that on Google Cloud. And essentially for any repo, you can just drop a little YAML file with a link to a Docker container and then it runs that. So they can just um, uh, point at that, click from your browser when you're reading the readme um, and you can try it immediately. So that's quite nice. And then lastly, uh, and maybe the most obvious use is you can also do this for continuous integration. I do all of this with the script run.sh, which is a continuation of the initial script that we um, uh, wrote for Travis and that I continue to use because I like that a little bit better than the than the alternatives. I find it easier to test um, and, and debug. And with that, um, the typical usage basically looks the way it looks over on the right. So I have that type of snippet in several dozen of my read mode, read me, um, repos, there's, there's one default action that deals with the checkout and gets the Git repo to the directory. And after that, I'll just fetch the script with curl, make it executable and use it to bootstrap. So depending on the OS, um, supports macOS and, and Linux, get the required components in, then just deal with the package dependencies. That's where BSPM and R2U come in and then run the tests, which typically is just uh, build a tarball and then run our command check around it. And uh, that now works faster than uh, all other alternatives that I'm aware of. Uh, it's also competitive seemingly with the caching notion that you can get from the actions. And because it goes back to proper um, app-driven use, it's uh, also a bit more rigorous and, and, and solid. But by all means, if you're happy with the existing solutions, uh, please do continue to use those, but this uh, has helped uh, myself and a couple of other people in automating deployment of our solutions on uh, on Ubuntu. So with that, I'm done. And just a quick thanks to you know all our package authors for building something so wonderful for all of us to use and doing it out in the comments. A uh, big thank you to the CRAN team because this repository is really one of a kind. And to Aldrich, David, um, Stefan, Charles, Don, Michael, and everybody for the earlier work on these things. And our studio, it should be our studio, not our studio, now posit for SPM and Iñaki for BSPM. <clears throat> My colleagues in Urbana for hosting this, in particular Rami Das for setting the VM up, and Pixabay for the three pictures that I use there and my GitHub sponsors for all the uh, free coffee money. And uh, documentation is in the R2U repo at GitHub and or at the GitHub pages hosted uh, site with the link there, it's just my name, GitHub.io and then slash R2U. That includes, if you follow that URL, the Git pod link that allows you to run this. Uh, for some reason that doesn't get um, shown when you just look at the readme rendered um, in the GitHub repo itself. And that's all I had, but again, I have the um, the session up here. So um, if someone has a question, wants to see another demo or let me try something live, we can, we can do that. And uh, that's all I had. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Dirk. Uh, we're really grateful to have you here. Um, if anyone else is like me and they work at a, a restricted corporate environment with little control over their systems. This is great because I always hold my breath when I'm <laughs> installing from source, but of course I can't hold my breath that long. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, really fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just uh, go through the chat. Well, there's not much there, but um, uh, John offered his gratitude uh to have having you today and uh told you i uh, said to keep up the great work um and there was also a little bit of uh, dialogue on offering binaries for apple arm um uh 
John uh, made the note that Arduino Package Manager does not currently support binary packages for Mac OS. Um, so I guess that, that's that. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd like to open it up to our participants. If anyone has a question, comment, uh, now's the time. So um, I have a question, I guess. Um, so, you know, I think the beginning part was was sort of a, a history of all the times we've done something like this before. And then it, it's like, you know, for whatever reason has sort of like fallen apart. <laughs> um, and, and part of that, I think, is it, it doesn't always seem like there's ever been like a home for it, right? It's always been like some person out of the goodness of their heart is like, <laughs> you know, going to take responsibility for this. Um, and so I guess the question I have, which is more of, I guess, a language sort of governance question, but, you know, where does this live appropriately for R, you know, a, as a language, <laughs> right? You know, like, you know, is it something that we always just sort of you know, like Dirk, eventually, I assume you want to retire, uh, you know, and, and, and not have to maintain things, right? Um, and so I, I guess one of the questions I always have is, you know, what's the, what's the pathway to sustainability or to sort of, you know, like a, a standard way so that that way it's just part of the architecture of the language as opposed to sort of something that somebody does out of the goodness of their heart? It's a good question. <clears throat> and there aren't many good examples because um, if I start at the far end, also historically back in the context of a distro, it's much easier to pass a baton of just building packages and maintaining packages in the continued umbrella of a distro. Someone retires, someone else picks up that package and there they go. So that's right. how I ended up with the R package because when I was a grad student, I got contacted by the person at the time maintaining it, who was a stats professor in Wisconsin by the name of Doug Bates. So that's how I became friends with my first parkour member. He just contacted me because he was a graduate of the Canadian University I was hanging out at the time. So a small world. So that has a natural evolution. For larger systems, it's much harder. Um, if we forget for a second that RTU now exists, we had this bus factor risk, for example, with CTU4R because it was a one person effort by Michael Rutter. And Michael and I are close. I help him a little bit, you know, edit the readme, do other stuff. And over the years, I try to help him broaden that, get it beyond the 5,000 packages, uh, take some note of his shoulder. And for different reasons, that, that didn't happen. He's a busy man. I mean, he's a uh, co admin or head of the, of the, Stats department on his uh, Penn State um, campus um, in in, in uh, at Lake Erie where he is, and so we we never really got around to sharing the resources and broadening that. And even then, it may not have been all that great because I'm as a single person, I'm already too much bus factor. So if that goes away, so what then? But there isn't really all that much. I was discussing that with a colleague the other day about who actually runs PyPy and you know what I then learned there it's not that much better there either because people individually as authors provide binaries and they get shipped up and the big donation that makes PyPy happy and feasible is essentially just bandwidth from fastly and and or maybe maybe server. So we don't we don't have this. I'm sort of in a good enough position because I know some people, but then again you can't put on a string. I sort of have politely knocked on the door to before I had the mirror particularly on on Cranston whether they'd be interested in hosting this because it's not long term viable if it only hangs off on my machine but you know they haven't had the time to look into this and carry that over and if you wanted to be critical and look at that a little bit more maybe Cran isn't even the greatest example of providing all that because for those 20 25 years that I've been around there's been exactly one person providing everything for the Macintosh named Simon so that's not particularly scale. There's one person for whom it is now effectively a paid job named Thomas who looks after Windows. So th they are not a great example. So in that sense, you know, having RSPM isn't bad because um, POSIT clearly sees this as a revenue creating service with which they can go to corporates to tell them, you know, well, we'll take care of all these binary buildings. You just write us this check and then you have them and then everybody's happy. Because yeah. the corporates uh, don't need to find, pay, and maintain the manpower to do that locally because it's clearly something that scales and uh, and, and it gets uh, more paying customers. Um, 
but that's also a string we can't push on because as we said, you know, if you're on uh, an ARM machine, bad luck for you. If you're on a distro that they don't cover, bad luck for you too. So it's 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 really hard. Um, it would be good to institutionalize some of this. Um, I just had an email the other day with some folks from Canonical who had reached out a couple of years ago and I went to a hackathon when a couple of open source people got invited to provide work around their Snap service. Snap is sort of their variant of Flatpak and a different way of providing binaries. So there's still interest in making R happen there. I mentioned R to you to them, kind of just told them, look what I just built. Maybe this is revenue for you. So, you know, maybe I can hand it off to those people. And then if they can make a buck, they invest a the resource. But it's, uh, you're, you're spot on. It's it's an open question. And because it's open source, it's all a little murky. Things more or less just evolve through time. Some things happen. Sometimes they work. As I chronicled in these slides, sometimes it stops working. And then it just sits there. Nothing happens. And someone else may pick it up. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's... It's a, it's a fair question, um, and it's uh, it's an important question. Some people seem to be thinking a bit more about that. I see the buzzword um, open source supply chain, and then the added terms risk analysis for the supply chain branded about a little because you want to make sure that these things are there, are free of risks and contamination and viruses and whatever, and also ensure to be uh, be available. So it's just it's it, it's something I guess we have to we have to figure out. I've only been in six months with this variant of it. Uh, you know, after twenty years of trying to make something like that happen, I quite like it. So right now I just use it and, and continue to build it because I use it. But yeah, I could of course get tired of it one day, stop doing it, but then. Yeah. One would hope that someone else would jump into the fray, but it's uh, it's, it's 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 an unresolved problem, and it's a, it's a it's a very important question you highlight there. Yeah, I guess it's kind of weirdly reassuring that that the Python folks don't necessarily have a great answer either. Like, it's not a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not good that that's true, but like it also sort of says it's not like an R problem. Like, this is just a hard maybe problem. You know? Yeah, I, 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 exactly. I completely agree. I mean, there. To a first approximation, 10x us, users, packages, authors, infrastructure, probably also funds, and you know, exactly. And they haven't they haven't sorted it out either. I mean, they have. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, in the same context, uh, I've been using CRAN or pushing packages to CRAN for 20 plus years. And at least the last 15 of these, we have been worrying about, oh my God, if CRAN grows, it's too much for them to maintain, who will help them. And we haven't solved that problem either because. Yeah, um, some, some, sometimes the solutions seem obvious, but not, are not obvious to, to implement. So it's, yeah, it's. This is where we insert that XKCD where it's like the big stack and the entire internet is running on the one little brick at That's the right. bottom. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yep. Cool, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, I just, exactly. I just put another layer out of bamboo in the middle of that stack right now. Exactly. <laughs> don't, don't, don't rock it too hard. You time for oh, go ahead. <clears throat> no, sorry, Alec. Yeah. This is nope. impressive work as usual, Dirk. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, I think you know what my question. <laughs> my Let's question. Do SVD. <laughs> so what you know? How 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 does it respect the alternatives with respect to you know BLOS libraries in particular? But let's oh. say I have you know I want to use a BLOS library that uses OpenMP and maybe some other libraries that use OpenMP versus threads. I mean, how do you manage all of that stuff in the stack? Um, that's actually completely outside of this. Because that question that you just asked just pertains to what in Debian Ubuntu speak then would be R hyphen base hyphen core, the standard binary package, and nothing's changed there. Because what we're doing here is just using the same playground field, if you wish, and just throwing more walls on it. But, you know, uh, BLAS is still an interface, and R at any one point in time um, is set up to use one. Uh, as I pointed out in prior work, you can switch them live. Um, something like that has now even been automated, and there's a package that Eden Yaki also put on the CRAN, and I'm forgetting the name, you can do it from within. But basically, this this live switching still 
still works and because that interface is so old and time tested that it will work with all the packages because they will not know. Yeah, that, that works so far as the BLOS, but it goes a little deeper than that, right? Like some sometimes you, you mentioned the GNU scientific library. There's the, there are other libraries that have dependencies alternatively on either threads or OpenMP. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Not every yeah, platform you know, uh, works OpenMP, yeah. for instance, right? So, like, I mean, it, you know, I, I see, I see your you question or more, 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 more properly. Yeah, um, it's not opinionated because we're not replacing apt. It's still, uh, it's still orthogonal because it still adheres to whatever you do on your system for that particular aspect. So I'm trying to think of a particular library that would come in different variants. Wasn't the HDF5 one? There, there are a few of those. There are and, a few. Yeah. Say again? There are a number, right? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's right. And, and typically it's set up in such a way that you only have one at any one point in time. And then you may stop your application, switch it, restart it, and then you have the other. But it, it won't, that, that, that's really... It's it's a level below, if you wish, in the in in the stack because well, it's I, I guess I, you have to excuse my ignorance with respect to packaging on operating systems. But like, I mean, you know, one our source, one package on CRAN in source form can map to multiple binary packages depending on the de dependency tree, of course, right? So so how how would that be handled in this context? I, I guess would be my question. That's in apt, I guess, not really here. So somehow that's managed by apt. Or dpackage? Yes, and um, you, you it, that's basically, I mean, that's they, they're great questions, but they, they mostly, I think, pertain to what happens. How, how do we package um, um, R itself on a, on a Linux distro? So these, these clan packages then are just, you know, customers of that or users of that service or that implementation. They, they, they don't change anything around that because, as you also know, uh, builds governed from R just do you know R, R space command space compile R space command space schlib and, and so stuff like that. So the packages just use the infrastructure as as they, it is provided to them by uh, um, by the system. I'm trying to think now whether we have a good example because then I could just live install one and show to you. Um, help me out now when you were saying, because I'm, I'm not seeing the package you could have in mind, that it's a single CRAN package which would manifest itself into three different binary packages? Well, um, I don't know how Debian handles this for, I mean, our core, but like our core, of course, has a uh, um, Packages that can use OpenMP, which is not something that's available on on every system, for example, right? So the yes. Apple M1 architecture doesn't support OpenMP. Yes, as, so, as I said, as I said, yeah. Gnadi Lee on that slide. But here we have it, and we always have it, and it's active. I see. So it would just be available, yeah. So it's by default, certain things are available, are kind of assumed to be available on these. Right. On these that's right. That's right. Um, um, and I guess, I mean, an extreme version of that would be the GPU-based packages, right? That have right. very specific dependencies on, on, on GPU stacks. Right, but that's, in a way, that's also not that different from the old dependency on what we had 20 years ago when we thought that was the future and it was a particular JVM. And at any one point in time, you may just be built against a particular version. And if that one's there, then you run. So Indeed. to R, then, it just requires glue code against a particular version of CUDA and if that one is installed and still there, then it runs. Yeah. And because we're now connecting the CRAN package by virtue of being a DAB installed with apt, apt will not uninstall the CUDA dependency that's there. And you now have a higher chance of maintaining this as working than without that. Yeah, no, and indeed. That, that but that, great. That's, a little, that's a little benefit that we bring, but, but other than that, the rest of it is still unchanged. You know, there's there's R as a language and environment, there's CUDA, and you sort of have to meet them in the middle. And, and this doesn't do anything different about it. Um, but one, one point though, yeah, where, where you're right, uh, you know, for the packages that I don't recompile, for example, I, um, I'm also reshipping however 
RSPM or PPM has built them. So I would get their compilation time choices where they could have opted in or out of OpenMP, but they, um, 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 in one of my favorite examples, um, they do it, of course, with, um, or so he says, because if I now say library data table, it'll probably tell me how many threads we're having here and it's a welcome message. Yep, see, so um, here's a litmus proof of on this machine with with eight hyper-threaded cores or eight extra cores, I've forgotten what I'm on here, and, and EC2, I, I get my multi-threading via pthreads OpenMP. So that one worked. So, yeah. So, cool. By and large, uh, it's a good situation because I always maintained that Ubuntu is actually a good platform for development because you get most of these sometimes hard to enable uh, or provide services actually available. I mean, to the extent that it's a bit easier to get, I don't know, Keras or Torch running on Ubuntu than it may be on some more obscure flavor. Or so just another, just a really quick question. Why why Ubuntu and not, and not Debian? Because I get it from RSPM and they don't do Debian. Ah, okay. And why they do that beats me. Uh, maybe because you know Ubuntu is an easier sell. I, I I really don't know, and they provide no documentation there, and I've I've no insight. But uh, you know when they first made this splash and announced RSPM, and we all looked at what they had, then it was always you know a flavor or two of Windows, a flavor or two of of Mac. I think it's always most current and one before or something like that, and already several Linux distros and they had you know, several CentOS flavors and OpenSUSE and this and that and Ubuntu, but but no Debian. Um, I probably would have taken it had it been available or not. I, I, I don't know, but in that sense, it's really it's really closer to what Michael had done all those years with Cran to Debian for Ubuntu, C to D for you, uh, his, his launchpad service and it, it sort of shadows uh, and then uh, overwhelms it now a little by having by having more packages, but it's it's really similar to his undertaking. Um, yet provides more packages because I managed to build them all rather than just some. But uh, yeah, other than that, on sort of architecturally challenging things like GPUs. MP databases, whatever, it, it imposes no constraints. It just takes whatever is available on the Ubuntu builds, which for most things should be what is available. I mean, it's a, it's a relatively good reference platform. So most, most things should be workable there. And so we provide them working. Thanks for the question, Brian. Uh, Still have some time for questions if anyone else has anything. Otherwise, I can chime in. And or demo if someone has a particular package they want me without safety net to try to install and see or something that frustrates them recently. Always, always happy to try. They're just in an ephemeral Docker container that's easy to fill and then throw away. <laughs> you already covered the the one that like always comes to mind, which is our Oracle, because it's such a pain in the ass to install. But you know, for obvious reasons, you don't have that one. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I had I had quant jobs uh, facing commercial databases, and that that can be really painful. Um, yeah, no, it's, the, the last the Oracle one in particular SQL, SQL server, they, they weren't shipping Linux drivers yet, and then we had to do these things with free TDS and what have you. That that's 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 painful, yeah. but. So. I, I, yeah, I, I never faced Oracle. I faced Sybase for a while in finance, but but not that. But yeah, yeah. So. So it's just to be clear, though, it's just like the commercial packages for the most part um, that are that are sort of limited. The ones that require sort of a commercial something to compile, right? Uh, Oracle, that is. Yeah, yeah, no, like generally, because you said like some packages aren't included, but it's usually yeah, because of that's like right, some... that's right. I, I would have yeah. to look at my config file, so you know, and then oddly, and I emailed with the author. There was one recently that relies on one using reticulate, and then uses reticulate itself, and and it, I, I in the build, I get a an an error um, when the package tries to get loaded at the end of the build step uh, and cram doesn't have that so that one I need to blacklist but it's it's a really it's a really short um, 
it's a really short list. Um, every, every now and then, you, you know, you know bills may go sour or be too complex or, or what have you. But um, the other thing I, I also haven't turned on is uh, because CRAN's so hyperactive on quality assurance and control and purging packages. So while they, and you know, I keep track of their count. So their count these days is, I think, at 18,900. Bunch of packages got thrown off on Monday again. I haven't purged, so I just built whatever is there. So I'm now a superset of Grand, which is why I'm now I, I don't know what twenty thousand, a couple of hundred or something like that. And, and, and the gap will of course widen. So with that, I mean, eventually, I have to figure out what I do there because you also don't want to distribute stale and unmaintained code. But right now, I figure, you know, if it was at Grand at one point it was buildable, I can be a bit more lax and still provide those binaries. And nobody has complained about that. But yeah, so that, that that's another delta in that sense. I'm it's a bit of a superset. Is R on Ubuntu built with uh, GCC still, Dirk? Um yes, uh, but that doesn't matter because I just had that. I was just uh, you know issue tracking notes with, with Winston Chang today earlier about chasing a bug with Ardeval and when he got a nasty gram from from uh, from Cran. It's uh it's interchangeable with with Clang because they are interchangeable. So the way that works um is uh you for every binary package you essentially provide a recipe. Uh a, that's build depends on Debian control for us, uh, for for Fedora and, and and Red Hat. It's the it's a spec file, and you just put a compiler in there, so you could mix between Clang and GCC. But it just happens to be GCC because I have no reason to overwrite it. Um, I'm just trying to think whether I ever no actually, and that may even be more structural because on. On these distros, we have a package called build essential that I make, for example, R base dev depend upon. And yeah, build, build essential C, for example, brings in GCC and G. So in that sense, they have a bit more of a formal standing in the distro than than Clang, but you could you could swap it. So on, on my box, I just keep a dot R slash make vars. Uh, where if I remove a couple of hash marks, then it's Clang and not GCC. That's helpful for debugging every now and then. But there, there shouldn't be a behavioral difference, which is why uh, when you look at CRAN and the status of a package, um, they tend to run both compilers on a number of Linux systems for both Debian and Fedora. I mean, Kurt's machines, Brian Ripley's machines, they, they tend to just run both. And yeah, you, you can switch. Beauty of C. So I have a <clears throat> question, if I may. Um, early in your slides, uh, when you were listing the operating systems, you made a, ref a couple references to Conda. Um, now, uh, can you contrast what you've done here with what Conda offers as well, because it does offer binaries and, and uh, system dependencies for R as well. Um, no, that's a that's a good question, and um, I'm personally not that heavy a user on Conda. Um, the work is uh, so tiledb ships a lot with Conda, so I'm seeing it a bit more now, more than I used to. But I mostly um, most rely on colleagues helping with that. So I still don't know Conda all that all that well. I every now and then just test things and hop into Conda or Number via Docker container. Um, I believe um, that Conda is partial provides partial coverage of CRAN, sort of similar to what's in Debian itself now, because if you don't point at my RTU repos and on a normal box, uh, do an um, apt cache space search space R hyphen CRAN, on a Debian box now you get about 1,000 packages, which is really not bad. Um, most of them current. Um, 
my Karada gives you about 5,000 for Ubuntu. And I, it's my understanding that Conda is sort of somewhere on that order. So it's it's most, but not all. It's relatively easy to extend. That's just something we actually needed to do at work today because on one of the packages we do there are packages I injected a new dependency. So we have to get the package up there and then we actually had, had hiccups with that. So, but but um, I, I don't really know it all all that well and that's a bit of that is sort of cultural because i spend all the much time with debian and ubuntu my personal preference when i work with python still is to um, if i can get by with the python packages in the distro because i know the distro takes care of it updates them and i don't have things going stale in, in user local lib um, that's just how i tick so with that I, I never became a super heavy user of conda the other bit of course is that um, because Conda does well in providing breadth, they have to make some architectural choices for compilers and other things that makes interoperability a little hard. So as an open source maintainer, I was a little burned because every now and then I would just get error reports from people kind of, oh, the package doesn't build, doesn't install. And, and once you sort of dialogue a little with people in probe, then it just turns out that they were mixing Conda and non-Conda builds. And those things don't really work that well. So it's it's... I've, I've come to understand that Conda works well for you if you stick with Conda and hold it. And mm -hmm. so, for example, the friends that look after Reticulate do exactly that. These days, when you install Reticulate, they've essentially, you know, given up trying to accommodate all different permutations of operating systems and other things, and under the rug, install a mini Conda environment for you, which you can overwrite. With an environment variable, so I do that because I can trust my 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 Ubuntu Python installs. Um, someone at by Aaron Lang, um, Aaron Lum at, at, at Bioconductor wrote a package called Basilisk that does the same. It's driven from R and just sets up a mini. I think it's still mini Conda, a Conda based environment for your Python packages to keep those together and leave some stuff running. So it's it's tricky. Um, uh, yeah, so. Uh, but I, I I wouldn't know the details. And, and the other thing that I always found compelling was, which is then one level more rigorous, if you wish, or, or just different, is just sticking it all in a Docker container. I still find those lightweight and appealing enough. It's not as heavy as a as a VM, and it's self-contained. Then then you can ship that and I um, and or remove it. And I, uh, I I've preferred that so far also. So when I don't get by with local Python uh, packages, then I often just stick it in a in a, in a quick container and then walk the container for the work. And Thanks. Again, yeah. The container would be then again Debian or Ubuntu based and, and not, not Conda based, but you can, you can do that too. So, it's, for example, again, something that we do at work, a lot of our Docker based container are then Conda based Docker rather than standard distro. So, that's a, not, not that it should matter, but it's, it definitely has its fans and its users, but I'm, I'm not the right person to ask, to, 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 provide technical answers for the, for their guts. I just, I just don't know. Thanks. Yeah. For, for better or worse, uh, our big compute servers are on Fedora and, uh, the only way I, I can actually get our on those servers easily is through Miniconda. So, um, but I was, and I was, how's, how's that working for you? Mostly works. It does. Yeah. I was, uh, pleasantly surprised, uh, with, with, uh, how it worked. Um, it's it was really straightforward and and the installation was uh uh effortless i guess <laughs> i guess people will complain yeah, exactly. about I mean, the, the goal for all these things of course is to not get in your way and yeah if you if you play by the rules and do it right it's good the the, yeah. the other thing too that sometimes comes up someone asked that um you know does rtu help you in an hpc context and uh, the answer is not quite, but it could, in the sense that here, because we're either invoking app directly, for which you need the big um, tinfoil hat, uh, you know, and pseudo powers to work with the system manager, or have a system set up where it was set up for you so that you can make that call out that the BSPM was set up that way, even if you don't have pseudo, then that works. But if you don't have that and you have to install local um, below your home directory, then the solutions provided by um, RSPM, PPM, 
could work, but they have to be aligned a slightly different way. And it's just not something that I've looked into here. So, so this isn't really set up for this, but um, the tireless Inyaki has a package for that on CRAN called, uh, confusingly, I think also RSPM. Uh, and that does just that. It, it goes to RSPM and installs packages for you and tries to help with the system dependencies when it can't go to the system manager so you can do it below below home. But I, um, it's not a need that I had because on, on my machines I have so to use. So I just stuck with BSPM and, and, and this route. But there, uh, some people have looked into that and one can possibly make, make some things happen. But that might eventually be yet another system like this and not this system that I built because that just goes to the system manager. At about 10 minutes left, if anyone has any other questions. If not, uh, I guess I have another one. Um, this might be outside the scope of what you're accomplishing here um but uh what does the workflow with our end look like with this is there is there compatibility there um it's a good question and i didn't didn't stress this one either earlier there's a slight missing on that so what we're basically doing here or, or i guess i came to it tangentially is when you're going the route of um, also using BSPM and having the advantage of going from R and having the straight benefit of basically empowering installed or packages, you're in a really good spot because it works with all things that work with installed or packages. Mm -hmm. um, when we first did this, there was a technical reason that, that since got resolved, I've forgotten what it was, that for example, would allow you in our studio to make this work, say, in the console or on the R prompt if you worked it dire directly. But I think if you went through the packages tab, it was doing something else and it didn't work. But there was, I think there was just a technicality and had something to do with, 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 with BSPM. I keep forgetting. It's probably in the repo in one of the issues. Inyaki took care of that. So that now works. Um, RNF, it is my understanding, does not wrap around installed or packages. So these um, these two therefore don't mesh that mm -hmm. greatly. Um, it also tends to install locally. I mean, in a uh, they call the file lock file in a lock directory or your, your your local virtual environment below your home directory outside of the system. So it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mismatch. Um, but just how I mentioned earlier, how Inaki has this other work that takes the binaries from RSPM and tries to unflatten them below your home directory. There may be a way to make this work for RNF um, because there clearly are a lot of uh, very happy customers of, uh, of Kevin Oshi and his RNF framework that a lot of people like. Another thing that could potentially be done here, though it's, it's not straightforward because F generally doesn't tick this way, but what was first pioneered with MRAN and what BSPM still does is basically date indexed uh, metadata for the set of packages. We could do the same thing here if someone wanted to, because right now when version 1.2.4 comes out, I build it and I delete 1.2.3 that it replaces because, you know, this space is finite and I just want to provide the newest as Cran does, the old one goes. One could very easily keep all build versions in a much larger pool directory and then just have different indexing layers on top of that by basically swapping um, the app level packages file to one that, you know, for first instance, maybe you point them to the first of the month or something like that. So just, you know, just get me this as it was in beginning of October of this year or, you know, August or sort of something like that. It hasn't been done yet, but it's, it's basically just a matter 
of the indexing and the metadata. Where it gets a little more complicated is to that um, basically Debian and Ubuntu don't do that with the sysdebs. Um, while people have done this for R via Orange to roll back the packages, you can't in the same way roll the systems back. Mm -hmm. Just because the system doesn't have the hooks for it. So with that, um, you know, for as much as I'm in awe of Kevin Ushi's chops as a coder and, you know, co-author of RCPP and all things, when I started, I was kind of looked at it and kind of went, well, why would you do that? If you want to free something in time, you use a Docker container. So I, you know, I've been on record as that as, it's not singing this gospel as loud as a couple of other people, but then some people have also mixed it. There's clearly use for this, and then people should just go off and 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 try it. It's just as a long time sort of Debian and Ubuntu user, I'm not quite sure um, how I would say, you know, give me the system as it was on February 15th, as we can do with RNF and MRAN. So it's a, mm -hmm. a little tricky. I mean, we do that in Rocker too with the with the other branch, the the version branch, um, by keeping it based on a particular snapshot as a release so it's yeah it's it's tricky uh people care about this it has a lot of impact for replicability reproducibility um, you know scientific openness and honesty of doing something exactly as it was at one point in time but to me the more obvious solution is just if you want to freeze something in time then just f and freeze it in time and congel it in the docker container or vm that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's just but there's there's many strokes from for many different folks, and there's 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 different ways to skin the same cats and, and get to the same outcome. So there's 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 really not one size fits all. Mm 